South Africa doesn't need another regional party. It doesn't need another narrow ethnical party or anything of that nature. If you look at the metrics in South Africa, I don't think you can point to a single metric and say this is positive change. Uh, but the simple truth of any country with a rule of law is that you must enter that country legally. And once here, you must obey the laws of that country. Spread the fire. Spread the fire. Spread the fire. Spread the fire. Welcome back to SMWX. And today I'm really excited to be joined by the chairperson of Action SA, Michael Beaumont. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Absolute pleasure. I love being in studio here. It's always better than engaging virtually and for sure. computers. And I think uh, the platform you've created is interesting. I watch thank it you. with great interest and you know, I hope I can live up to that standard. You know, Action SA burst onto the scene in the most recent um, local elections and surprised many South Africans with your showing, having only contested, I think it was six municipalities. Take us through what's been happening since that moment of, you know, really shocking South Africans with your performance. And of course, gearing up for this big election, which was always going to be the prize for, for the party. Sure. So I mean, in, in 2021, as you say, sees where we contested six municipalities out of 278. Yeah. We were only a year old at the time. So we took the strategic decision to be narrow in our focus and then branch out thereafter. Sure. And despite that, came sixth in the country overall. Uh, and from our point of view, the focus since that day has been to grow in nine provinces. South Africa doesn't need another regional party. It doesn't need another narrow ethnical party or anything of that nature. It needs a party that can produce broad appeal for South Africans. At least that is our belief. Uh, so the project since then has been about growing in nine provinces. Um, you know, Herman has gone out of his way to identify really strong leaders across the country, the likes of people like Athol Trollope and Zwakele Mwango, uh, Korsi Kwenamangope. These are people who have regional appeal in their own provinces. And we've been on the ground building structures day by day because sure. the reality of South African politics is, you know, the votes aren't won so much in the, the Twitter spaces and Facebook pages as much as they are on the doorsteps of South Africans. Mm. And if you don't exist at the street corner level in South Africa, it's very difficult to get your message across to people. And that's been the major focus of our campaign. We've, of yeah. course, had a big policy conference in September last year mm, because mm. it's one thing to have the networks. You've got to have the product uh, yeah. to take to the South African people. Yeah. But certainly the experience has been a fascinating one because, you know, you can't ask for a better environment to, to, to sell hope. In that's South for Africa. Sure. That's for sure. Because there's just so much disillusionment with the political establishment. Mm, mm. Yeah, that's true. And and I guess one thing that's interesting about Action SA is that you haven't been put into the pigeonholes of other parties. You've been able to appeal quite broadly. So you've got township voters, you've got um, urban, uh, suburban voters, you've got some rural voters, we'll see, but it looks like you're working on that. You've managed to position yourself to attract a, a DA voter, maybe, but also an ANC voter, maybe even an EFF voter if, at a stretch. Talk us through that strategy and and the the gap you saw in the political market, as it were. Yeah, without any question. I mean, if you look at the, the political marketplace in the favored terms of traditional politics with left and right and that kind of dynamic, what you basically have is a dynamic where the DA moved to the right to kind of out freedom front the freedom front and shore up their losses from the last election. Sure. I think in many ways the ANC's moved to the left to out EFF the EFF mm. to defend their flank on the left. Mm. Uh, and I think so many voters exist in the kind of rational center of South African politics who are saying, where, where do we go? Uh, and that's why you have this dynamic that despite you know, the soaring unemployment and load shedding and crime problems we have in South Africa, you can still have a majority of voters who, who don't turn up because they just feel alienated and left behind. And I think certainly that's a market that we have tapped into quite heavily. And that market, you know, doesn't look the same. Uh, it's not the same age. It doesn't pray to the same God. It's, you know, widely varied and very diverse sets of communities. And, you know, what happened in 2021 is we were winning voting districts in townships and informal settlements, but, you know, also in the suburbs um, and in the rural areas, you know, in our subsequent growth. I think importantly for us was the need to break out of Gauteng because there's no question sure. Action SA has got a big footprint in, in Gauteng. It is our epicenter. It is our goal to be the biggest party of a coalition in Gauteng because we need to lead a government and not be 
a bridesmaid to the DA sure. in another coalition. Uh, but certainly from a point of view of other provinces, what we're seeing is growth in places like Polokwane. An EFF ward will be cracked about 9.6%. Uh, in Kwanungoma, it's about as rural as it gets, mm. at 102 In Kwanobuhle in the Eastern Cape at 78 uh, and all of these really just initial showings in other provinces that reveal the potential. Uh, but like all things, potential is not counted by the IEC, it's votes. And you've got to go out there and mobilize and get those numbers over time. I think the good thing is we've we've made the infrastructural investments on the ground to go out and achieve that. So I want to come to, you know, some of the things that are happening this year, which will bear on the election. And I guess the first the first place is, is to look, we, we're going to have the SONA coming up soon. And, you know... What do you make of President Ramaphosa's term? And how do we diagnose this term? And why do you think, as Action SA, President Ramaphosa is not the person to carry South Africa forward and that the ANC is not the party for South Africa? How do you, how do you challenge the incumbency of the last five years? Well, I mean, I think it, it's, it's almost impossible to do anything but challenge it. If you look at the metrics in South Africa, I don't think you can point to a single metric and say this is positive change. And I think the disappointment that's just so fundamentally surrounds President Ramaphosa like an aura is that, you know, he came in on this ticket of hope. He promised a hell of a lot. Uh, and essentially, the disappointment that so many South Africans feel is that those promises weren't carried through. Uh, there was so much talk about renewal and hope and, you know, a new dawn and, sure. and all of these things. And, you know, South Africans are, are positive and hopeful people. We want to believe in something as a people. Yeah. Which is why when you give us stage six load shedding, we make jokes about what stage seven might be. You know, we, we're a people that like yeah. to... We start hoping for stage yeah, four. exactly, exactly. So, you know, I think the danger of that politically is that he created and dispelled that same hope. Mm. And he's left a lot of people hugely disappointed. And I think particularly his, his term of office has just been branded by weak leadership. Yeah. Uh, and you can think about any number of examples, but, you know... Those videos telling us how they're really, really, really going to fight corruption during the COVID pandemic, et cetera. I mean, there was just no credibility behind these things. Uh, and there's just so much lip service to good ideas with no implementation, no carry through. And the clearest demonstration we were going to be going down the same path uh, really came in the form of the retention of the exact same cabinet of Jacob Zuma. How do you refer to the nine lost years of Jacob Zuma? And the Beki Kriele remains very much your Minister of Police, Angie Mocheka with education, Bladen Zamande with higher education. This is not a demonstration of change. It's a demonstration of what Ramaphosa said to us from day one, is that if the choice comes between being a good president of the ANC and being a good president of the country, he was going to choose the ANC. Yeah. I think in South Africa, sometimes we must learn to listen to what people say to us. Um, in terms of the ANC... You know, I, I think the reality is, is that the ANC's decline has become precipitous. Uh, it's got to the point where I think it's irreversible. The debate really is about how much it's going to decline by sure. and how much it can arrest or, 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 or that nature. And I think if you just look at the dynamic of unemployment and load shedding and crime and all these different dimensions in South Africa, uh, there is no way that the ANC's decline is reversible. Yeah. Uh, and it's just a question of how soon they will lose power and what will take its place. What are you thinking in terms of, of how far the ANC could fall? I mean, there's been a lot of debate about whether they'll cling on to that 50%. I think recent polling suggests that that's increasingly unlikely. But at the same time, 48 and 50 might be practically the same thing if they can, if they can get a couple of small parties onto the bandwagon. Yeah, look, it's an interesting debate. I must tell you straight from the outset, I'm very cynical about polling in South Africa. I think polling around the world is, is a science that's becoming more of an art. Uh, but in South Africa, I think we're missing the mark quite fundamentally from a okay. polling point of view. To be uh, fair, you were significantly underestimated in the local elections. Yeah, certainly. Um, and I think just the reality of a voter being able to say six months out what they're going to do, and that remaining true six months later is no longer the case in the low trust environment in which most people you know, interact with their politics. Sure. Uh, but from our point of view, certainly, I think the ANC is going to fall below 50. We see it further below 50 than that. We think it actually could be the low 40s. Hmm. Uh, and that's because, you know, people often make the mistake of looking at these changes as being linear. And I don't think so. I think there becomes a critical mass moment yeah. uh, where there's going to be a breakaway of support either to another party or to, you know, the I don't vote column anymore, which has grown massively mm -hmm. in South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just don't see the ANC being able to get past that. 
the, the raging debate, of course, is, you know, what will they do to get over the finish line? Yeah. And there's a number of theories that have been mooted, whether it's, you know, their newfound partnership with the Democratic Alliance, which is a fascinating study mm, in itself. We should get into that, yeah. We should. <laughs> uh, the EFF itself, I think, yeah. has put its hand up. Um, and, you know, really, I think what is creating South Africa from our perspective, uh, to be helpful to this conversation, is, mm. you know, 2024 needs to become a referendum on change. I think those parties that want to continue a status quo or even accelerate it must be grouped on one side, and those who want to campaign around change must be grouped on the other. And I don't think South Africans should allow political parties to sit in the middle and campaign around change and then throw their lot in afterwards because that's yeah. a form of fraud and betrayal. And at the same time, I think we really need to see a dynamic where you know parties are held to account about where they land on these questions prior to the election so that they don't find their vote being sold out to the highest bidder, which is a product of our electoral democracy in South Africa. Can I ask you, because you spoke about the Ramaphosa presidency being a continuation um, of effectively the Zuma era. And of course, we've seen former President Jacob Zuma now entering this election uh, with his MK party. What do you make of that? Because I actually haven't heard Action SA's reaction to former President Zuma's new political moment. Well, I mean, it's not something that we, we go out and seek to comment on a lot. In fact, yeah. one of the things that Action SA has resolved about our campaign is we want to spend this campaign talking about us. Yeah. And the offer we want to make the South African people, because I think people are just fed up with, you know, individual parties that talk more about other parties than sure. the needs of South African people. Uh, but certainly we've observed it with great interest. I mean, it's clearly an event that's going to have an impact in the electoral landscape. Mm. I personally do think that sometimes these things are overstated about how much, because perhaps, you know, more than most, I have inside knowledge on the works of creating and establishing a political party. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not as simple, and it can't just be done by strong brands. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of elements to it. You know, when those strong brands have to produce candidate lists and those processes get challenged by unsuccessful candidates, mm -hmm. these are the kind of things that actually kill political parties. And you saw it in COPE and others. Uh, and whether or not MK will be able to surpass these tests, only time will tell. Sure. Uh, but certainly, I think it's appealing to a market within the ANC. <laughs> rather than anywhere else. And I think from our point of view, the, the approach remains head down and mm. focus on an action essay agenda. Sure. You know, I want to come onto that, that action essay agenda. Actually, so much of what you've spoken about, I want to delve into further. Just your experience on a personal level of building a new political party and, and what that means. But let's come to action essay first, because the policy offering is also interesting. It's one minute you think, okay, Action SA is going in this direction. And then you're like, oh, okay. They're offering a concession in that direction. And it's it's a it's a new suite of policies that we haven't seen under one political house before. I think the first one that piques my interest is the basic income grant proposal that you've put on the table. Talk us through what that is and why you think that would serve South Africa. So we don't call it an income grant so much as a universal basic income stimulus. Sure. Uh, and forgive me, these aren't just semantics, they are important. Because, yes, the role of a social relief network in grants is something that we affirm uh, through our policies. There's no question, if you look at the inequalities in South Africa, those can't be wished away after 30 years. There needs to be decisive and direct action from government. But it is our perspective that what we need is a kickstart or a jumpstart to our economy. And when you look at expansionist financial policy and fiscal policy, it, it focuses on the need to pump money into the economy and circulate money and to have people in the lower income strata of our country who are provided with these financial resources, which we know they spend in their surrounding economies and communities. And it generates a level of economic activity that's quite important to turning around a country. Now, it sure. won't alone do that, but obviously yeah. in conjunction with many other economic measures, it is a bit of a, a jump start to the economy. Mm. It talks about the need of a basic income stimulus directed at people, I think firstly at the food poverty line in the first year, the lower uh, poverty bound line in the second, sure. and the upper poverty line in the third. And you're using stats essays, grid Absolutely, and there's very powerful science behind how this can really have a material impact, both in terms of social relief, mm. because obviously this is not for all South Africans, it's for people sure. at a very particular level but doing so in a much more meaningful way than 350 Rand is ever going to do. Yeah. 
and and take us through some of some of the further detail about that. I see the the gradations and over time. Um, what about the financial feasibility? We know that the, the the fiscus is under increasing pressure. Even this time five years ago, there were things that could be done that maybe are more difficult now. Why do you think that the economic case makes sense apart from the social case? Well, I mean, I think it's a reality of, of the South African fiscus that you can either take the approach of trying to conserve what you have as it declines, or you can take the approach of saying, we need to grow our fiscus by increasing revenue mm. and driving economic activity. Because the central challenge behind South Africa's kind of fiscal management is declining revenue uh, and increasing demands on the budget. So I think from that point of view, we have to turn that situation around. And that is where driving economic activity becomes so important. But I also want to say to you that as a very practical experience of someone who's been involved in government under Herman's mayoralship in Johannesburg, you cannot believe how many financial resources exist in government, mm. but are just squandered so needlessly. Mm. I mean, I'll give mm -hmm. you a practical example because I don't want to just talk to you about pie in the sky stuff. Yeah. But I mean, in Johannesburg, within a few months, we were able to identify two billion rands worth of expenditure on international travel, hmm. conferences, membership. Yeah. I mean, down to the level of, I think, 20 million rand on DSTV. Just yeah. <laughs> on that, someone I was speaking to who had seen some spreadsheets in the treasury said that you would not believe the bottled water budget yeah. of the South African government. Like you can build massive infra infrastructure with the bottled water budget. Without any question. And, and what it comes down to is a mindset set of civil servants. Yeah. Because when, when Herman went in there and he started, you know, being Herman, he's a very detail oriented kind of business minded person. And he started seeing that the city was paying like 200 Rand for a liter of milk. Yeah. He's saying, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, you're, you're, a, you're a civil servant, yes, but you're also a person who presumably goes to the store and buys milk. Mm -hmm. How do you justify spending 200 rand on milk a litre? Would you do that in your personal capacity? Mm -hmm. And of course the answer was no, but there's something about the mindset of civil service that we need to change in South Africa where the respect for public funds is the same as respect for your own funds. Mm -hmm. And they shouldn't be the same. Absolutely. <laughs> and, I, and I think, I mean, I don't know if the ANC will, will, will come down far enough. Maybe it will, but... If someone could go into South Africa's budget and have the political capital to really start from scratch, I think there's a lot of fat we can find in that budget that can, can be redirected towards developmental goals. The word we use is, is zero-based budgeting. Mm. Because when you come in in a new government, and, and hopefully as new governments come in provincially and or nationally in this election, yeah. you need to change the organizational direction of government. Now, I mean, people don't understand this always, but I mean, government is the proverbial oil tanker. It will do what it's been doing yeah. with a sense of inertia that you actually cannot turn around very easily. It takes a tremendous amount of influence, especially when the line between party and state has been so eroded that the party agenda has taken root at that kind of level. Yeah. So when we came into Johannesburg, it was a similar story. I mean, 34,000 employees at the time, uh, one party government for so many years. And to turn that around is not an easy thing at all. Yeah. Uh, and zero-based budgeting is a big part of it because there's just certain things that are assumed about budgets because of the particular ideology ideology of the governing party. And we need to reverse those assumptions, start on what's most important and work backwards. One of the worst parts about South African government we found is that everyone likes a priority and it's easy to say something's a priority. Mm. But a priority means a, a, a deprioritized thing as well. Sure. Because if you prioritize everything, you're prioritizing nothing. And I think that's a conversation we need to start getting right into mm. the African government mm. as well. So when you emerged from the policy conference, one other thing that was interesting to me is that you you did move course on some questions, which is fine. Uh, political parties yeah. don't always have to have the same policies for you know their entire lives. Mm. Um, and the death penalty was something that you came out of the blocks with, um, and and you went you went back on that. Talk us through those conversations and talk us through why the party having initially seeming to be on the on the side of the death penalty, uh, rather decided against it? Well, it was an interesting debate because, you know, a number of people in Action SA, and I count myself amongst them, so does Herman, you know, really have gotten to a point where we see a criminal justice system that's become patently soft on crime. And we see a number of repeat offenders who a failed criminal justice system keeps putting out there. And how many violent rapes and murders are we reading about with people who shouldn't have been free in the first place? And we see it all the time. 
And the point of view really was, you know, how do we protect law-abiding citizens in South Africa and shift the debate from criminals? Because the discussion around, you know, criminal justice rights appears largely around criminals or alleged sure. criminals, I sure. should say, uh, and not around victims. And there was a strong view in favor of the idea of the death penalty for a number of reasons. But ultimately, what shifted the party away from that, and I, I count Herman self as well, mm. is that when you listen to experts, which our policy conference processes that led to it was really about bringing in experts around the table to offer you perspectives, recognizing as a tangent that politicians really should not be writing policies on education unless they've taught a child or on healthcare unless they've healed a patient. Uh, and I think in that regard, we listened to experts and what they made very clear to us is that South Africa's inequality probably finds no greater expression than in our justice system, where those who have the means to pay the inordinate amounts of money for legal representation will get away with it and can afford appeal after appeal after appeal that makes punishment you know, a distant kind of thing. Mm. Uh, whereas those who don't have the means are very vulnerable. Uh, and you can't unexecute somebody and you can't reverse that decision. And ultimately what the party came down to is the way we marry these concerns is the idea of changing the minimum sentencing of this country that when we say you are sentenced to life for the perpetration of a violent crime. We throw away the keys uh, and you will never get out again so that you can perpetrate more violent crime upon South Africans. And that is the, the duty we have to law abiding South Africans as a first and foremost responsibility. Thanks for watching SMWX. I just wanted to tell you if you're enjoying what you're watching, how you can help support this channel and keep us growing and becoming bigger and better. Become a member of the channel on YouTube. There are different membership plans and you can give us some fuel to fire the SMWX machine. Also, if you're a brand, I'm interested in building the community of people who watch this channel. And so if you want to advertise, I'm much more interested in the people who are already fans of this channel partnering with us than going out to some external advertising brand. So get in touch with us at our email address down below. You can also buy books and merchandise. Check the description for how to support SMWX and help spreading the fire. Of course, the more we do this, the bigger we can grow this channel, the more resources we can use to keep informing and entertaining you. Now let's get back to the episode. The question of immigration has, has been at the center of, of your party, of the career of, of Herman Mashaba in politics as well. Uh, you've, you've caught some flack, you, you've taken some criticism for, for being anti-immigrant. Um, Mr. Mashaba's rhetoric has been in the spotlight a number of times. A lot when he was in the DA though as well, and I think there has been something of a shift in Action SA. What do you say to this criticism that, that Action SA's policies on immigration are, are, are anti-immigrant uh, and, and, and may stoke xenophobia? Well, I just don't think there's any truth to it, because if you look at our position, I think what Action SA holds on the immigration debate is the tightrope of the rational centre uh, conversation around immigration. Our policies are quite explicit, and uh, Herman's beliefs I don't think have ever changed in that regard, is that we want South Africans, we want the world to come to South Africa. We want people to come here to visit, to work and to play. Uh, but the simple truth of any country with a rule of law is that you must enter that country legally. And once here, you must obey the laws of that country. And I think those are basic premises that are fundamentally reasonable. I think where often, you know, a disservice has been done to Herman and Action SA is that sometimes these headlines are, are very, you know, unkind in the way that they paint that position. Sure. And sometimes you need to learn how to communicate on such a way that you get the messaging right. And I think from our point of view, what we're at pains to say is that the problem of illegal immigration in South Africa is not one to be meted out upon immigrants. We think the language of xenophobes in this country is disgusting. Um, we think the idea of turning off the oxygen of people at Rahima Musa the next day after an election is it's criminal. And I think from that point of view, you know, we need to call it out for what it is. Our country lives on a tinderbox. And xenophobic violence is only ever a few minutes away. And anyone who stokes that for political gains is absolutely being gravely irresponsible. But at the same time, that can't silence South Africans in saying, we have a problem. 
And that problem is that we have borders that are almost non-existent. Uh, people cross into this country, goods cross into this country every single day. And the country is not exercising its right to determine under what circumstances a person may or may not enter our country. Uh, and effectively, that causes any number of problems, which I think are well documented in South Africa. And, you know, we don't need to belabor the point. They're very, they're very demonstrable. But it's a very multifaceted issue because yeah. we also need to deal with the fact that there's a lot of people who've been in South Africa for a very long time. Uh, and, you know, determinations are going to need to be made about what we do with people who ought to have been documented within a couple of months according to an Immigration Act and haven't. Uh, and how are we going to go about that work? Yeah. Uh, and effectively, there's a lot of complexity there. And anyone who takes, you know, a simplified approach of just saying we're going to deport people without recognizing that complexity is fundamentally missing out that this is a difficult issue. But it starts with a government that has obligations yeah. to its borders. As a political science student, you'll appreciate when you, in Politics 101, the very first criteria of a nation state is a border. And if you don't have that right, you're not going to be a successful country. You know, I've been thinking about this because on the one hand, there is no doubt that South Africa has a massive influx of of migrants. Um, the numbers, the numbers are well. <laughs> firstly, we we don't seem to know what the numbers are, but estimates seem to show that the numbers are very large. When you look at other countries around the world, whether even in Africa, in Europe, in Latin America, we have a big immigrant population. There's no doubt about that, um, and and we probably have a very large, um, if we could actually get the numbers, uh, illegal immigrant population in South Africa, and that is. I think I think some on the other side of this this debate kind of deny that and deny yeah. the the social pressures that that is causing. Yeah. But then there's there's a strategic decision. Do you do you focus your messaging um and I'm not saying Action SA does this. I'm just talking generally strategically and electorally. Do you focus your messaging on the illegal immigrants or do you focus your messaging on the ANC and say well I our border fences are like potholed streets. You know, it, it, it's a service delivery problem. Yeah. We have, we have a broken immigration system because our government is asleep at the gates of, of, of our borders. Mm. And, and for me, that's the conversation we need to have about how the, the state has been asleep at the wheel when it comes to basic, the basics of immigration management in any country. Without any question. And we fundamentally say that you cannot place the failures of immigration management at the feet of immigrants, many of whom are dealing with countries whose environment is, is untenable. Sure. And you have to place it at the hands of government. Government is responsible for that. And let's take it back one level as well, because I think one thing interesting about the Action SA policy on immigration mm. is it brings in one of your favorite topics is international relations. Mm. We have neighbors who create economic and political crises on our border and those crises manifest in this problem that we're having to deal with now. And we continue to practice quiet diplomacy with these neighbors when actually we should be saying tough diplomacy is called for and perhaps ZANU-PF officials shouldn't be allowed to come to South Africa. They shouldn't be allowed to come shopping in Santon. They shouldn't be allowed to hold their assets in South African bank accounts. And we should adopt some hard diplomacy measures to ensure that these crises are not grown on the doorsteps of South Africa, where invariably it's going to result in this problem. I think that's a conversation that's been decidedly absent up until now. But there's no question it has to be at the feet of government. And we're going to go one step further in this campaign. We also want to draw attention to how the failures of government have an impact upon people who are in this country, right. should be documented, do have rights in terms of the South African constitution, sure. and aren't being lived up to. So when you talk about a lot of those people in the inner city of Johannesburg, being kept in slum-like conditions at exorbitant fees and you know, terrible tragedies of fires and unsafe conditions. Those are slum lords who are exploiting people who have no legal recourse. And the reason they have no legal recourse is they don't have any paperwork. And we need to ensure that that part of the story is also told. Sure, sure. Hopefully we'll have you or other Action SA leaders back um, to delve deeper into your policy offering. And, and it's a long election, so... Our, our doors always open, but um, I wanted to get onto some coalition dynamics as well and just talk sure. about what's going on there. Of course, right now there's there's a a big 
hullabaloo about this deputy mayorship in 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 Tswane. What what are, what are your thoughts there? It's just odd that it's hell of a blue, uh, and I guess I kind of find it quite hard to take seriously an EFF uh, kind of discussion about how we should they they're concerned about public monies. But you know, if we we deal with the issue on its merits, and let's do that because Chwane is in a financial predicament, and Chwane's government, of which we are a part, has had some serious challenges sure. since twenty twenty one. And anyone who tries to tell you otherwise is kidding themselves. Mm. Is that you know there is a discussion to be had. Uh, firstly, a deputy mayor is not new to China; they exist all over the country. Uh, as a matter of fact, major metros like Cape Town, Etiquani, Nelson Mandela Bay have deputy mayors, uh, and the coalition, in its wisdom, saw fit to say, if we're entering an era of coalition government, we need co-governance. One of the causes of instability is when you have one-party dominance within a coalition. And to avoid that, the idea was to develop the position of deputy mayors and ensure that not you didn't have one party occupying all of these positions. And, and by virtue of that, you have a diversity of constituents being represented. I mean, let me give you a more explicit example. Sure. Is that if you look at the city of Chwane uh, with partners like the DA and the Freedom Front Plus, etc., Action SA is very concerned about an agenda that is mindful of the majority of residents living in townships in the city of Chwane. In that coalition, we represent the highest percentage of those voters, mm -hmm. and we need to be in positions so that we can ensure that that agenda is being well served. And there have been criticisms leveled about the ability of that government to deliver in those communities. And what I will say to people in terms of the cost factor is the following. Yeah. The deputy mayor comes from within the pool of MMCs. So it's she's, not, already, she's already there, basically. It, it, it's an add-on of responsibilities onto someone who already has responsibilities. Sure. And the notion that this is somehow going to have a material impact on a 47 billion rand city, it's a little bit childish. I mean, I think we need to put things into context. The question is, is it going to add value? Because I think if we have someone as capable as Dr. Nasipi Moya mm. and her credentials... Who is the are, deputy mayor... Nominee. Candidate um, at the moment, yeah. And if we have a set of delegations that have been approved that are fundamentally around service delivery and driving that agenda then I think it'll be money well spent. And I think really that should be the conversation. But I also think we need to deal with it what it is. It is a bit of politicking. And I did uh, take careful note when responding to the EFF to point out that they hold a number of deputy mayorships in struggling municipalities in KZN. Uh, and their concern in one province should probably be a concern in, in all. <laughs> well, let, let's, let's go deeper into this question because you alluded earlier to uh, this undercurrent of a potential... DA ANC agreement that that is not going away. In fact, it's been explicitly addressed by some leaders. So you look at the the Veterans League um, uh, president Snuki Zigalala of the ANC explicitly said, "Look, the direction we need to go is actually the DA." Um, Mavuso Msimang, when I don't know if he was or wasn't in the ANC at that at that time, yeah, I'm not sure. Hard if he to still. follow. <laughs> but um, which week it was? <laughs> but. At some point, he also intimated this could be a direction. Yeah. You've had Jordan Hill Lewis. You've had John Stienhazen saying, look, it's 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 not the, the worst of all worlds to go with the ANC. Now, in the context of the multi-party charter, where you know, you've been publicly brought in, other parties have been brought in, are you worried about this potential? And, and do you think it's a, a serious possibility? Without any question, it has been a major concern. Um, and, hmm. you know, certainly it was a concern all the time leading up to the Charter. There were many leaders, even more than you mentioned, who had hmm. spoken openly about the idea that this had to be the route for that party. Hmm. And effectively, it was something that we brought to the actual formation of the Charter because we didn't come into okay. it so much as we were there when it was created. Hmm. And we very explicitly said we will not sign up to any agreement unless it is explicitly put on the table that parties will not be pursuing yeah. those kind of governance arrangements. And we did that precisely because we don't want to be used as a stalking horse. We don't want a party that, you know, runs around, uh, you know, campaigning around change and then, you know, goes in with the ANC afterwards. Yeah. I want to say running with the hounds and hunting with the foxes or something like that. Mm, mm. Um, and, you know, we want to ensure that everyone here is committed to change. Uh, and what we, was were the well, we were actually successful in having a 
component of that agreement yeah. that specifically precludes any party mm. doing that. Mm. Now, the debate obviously rages whether they will or whether they won't. Yeah. Effectively, we've accepted that this is something not in our control. Mm. This is something between the DA and the South African people. Uh, and if that covenant is broken uh, and there is a change uh, in that policy, they're going to have to account to the South African people. What I will say uh, and I'll offer this piece of political analysis that I know it's more mm. terrain than no, mine. No, by all means. Is that if you're going to sup with the devil, you better have a long spoon. And any party that goes in with the ANC is going to find themselves struggling with some very real facts about coalitions. The first one of which is small parties don't change big parties. So you don't go into a coalition whose government, whose departments have been filled through cater deployment over decades yeah. and say, we're going to stop cater deployment. Because actually, you're the minor party, and the executive system of government in South Africa puts a lot of power in the hands of presidents and mayors and premiers, mm -hmm. more so than ministers, MECs, and, and MMCs. So I think there's just those realities. But also, you know, fundamentally, you know, there are going to be things that are intrinsically true about ANC government you can't reverse. And let's talk practically. If anyone goes in with the ANC, and I issue this challenge to anyone who considers doing it in this election, when the first pala pala breaks, and let's be clear, we're never far away from the next pala pala mm. in ANC. Mm. Or even if pala pala itself deepens, because... Absolutely. A motion of no confidence will be brought in Parliament, and we'll be the ones bringing it. Mm. And then very quickly, that alliance partner of the ANC will face the invidious choice mm. of that: do they do the right thing and collapse their own government? Mm. Or do they defend the indefensible? And they will be doing what ANC MPs have been doing for years. Mm. And in that moment, that party is gone. It's a, it's an interesting thought. You know, I mean, I guess listening to you, the answer is no. But, you know, I, I've thought if the ANC is on, you know, 45, 46, and it's looking for partners and parties that have gone beyond, you know, just the, 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 the small party mark and have really gone into the electorate, which I think you will do in this election, a clean coalition could be look action SA. we can do this with just the two of us you know that that's gonna i'm sure that offer is going to come come before your your table it may well come before our table and i can tell you categorically around the local government elections it did hmm. at various points and the one principle around which we've stood is that you cannot fix the problem in south africa in partnership with the problem and the minute you accept that the problem around education the problem around our economy the problem around crime and healthcare and public service and corruption and all these things is actually an ANC problem. You need to appreciate that we must stop looking for the solution involving the ANC. We need to find a solution outside of the ANC and even in our language. When we talk about transformation in South Africa, we're almost invariably only talking about BEE and ANC constructs where we need to change the language of South African politics and actually start to show people there is a viable alternative outside. Can we talk about the EFF as well? Because I think w one thing about the multi-party charter um, is, of course, I think many people in South Africa are interested at the prospect of a group of opposition parties banding together to challenge the ANC. But then there's been this attempt to brand the EFF as kind of even more or, or, the, or enemy number one in the DA's language and obviously excluded from the multi-party charter. And my analysis is that Without the EFF, neither the ANC nor the multi-party charter is going to be able to get over that crucial 50% mark comfortably. Should the multi-party charter, or should, let's leave the multi-party charter aside, should opposition parties think about, you know, the EFF more, more seriously? Um, or or is, is the correct strategic thing to be to be separating from the EFF so much. You know, I just, I don't think South Africans see the EFF as as dangerous as they're being presented by some in the multi-party charter. Yeah, and I think you must understand that some in the multi-party charter obviously have an agenda, uh, and yeah. that agenda involves a, a Roy or a Swarkhafar, whichever mm. you prefer the term. Mm. Uh, and, you know, they're going to bang that drum for their pol politicking, and that's the approach they're going to be taking. Yeah. Now, you know, I think, you know, we must be clear, there was a time where we worked with the EFF at a local government level. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and we found that to be a very constructive relationship at a Johannesburg level. 
And I think part of the difficulty we have in contemplating the relationship with the EFF at a national level mm. is twofold. Mm. The first is ideology is, is relevant at a national level now because you step into government in a coalition and you have to fix the economy as job number one. I mean, you now got you know, nationalizing the Reserve Bank and changing Section 25 of the Constitution as that frontline agenda and a completely different agenda on the other side. And I think from that reason, it becomes very difficult to align with the EFF at that particular level. But I also would humbly suggest that, you know, some things about the EFF's own conduct and behavior makes it very, very difficult to bring on board in a multi-party environment. So, you know, firstly, the, the racially polarizing language and behavior uh, makes it very difficult. And you must obviously realize that when you're working in a broad church of parties, you know, it doesn't help to gain one and lose three. It's not how coalitions work. And the EFF has actually, in my opinion, been strategically flawed in its approach by making it very hard to work with. You talk about them having that kingmaker status after the elections. Maybe the other option is they get left on the dance floor with no one to dance with because they're seen as too extreme, too radical. And I think it's almost best summed up through an anecdote I always share after the elections, which I thought was fascinating. I mean, one of the radio shows did a call in and the question was, do you want the EFF to win a municipality? Yeah. And if so, would you like to live in it? And what was fascinating about this, a lot of people said, yes, they'd like them to win, but no one wanted to live there. <laughs> and I think it tells you that dichotomy of how voters feel about mm, the EFF. Mm. And I think they've got yeah. to deal with that before they could become a viable and credible partner. For sure. And I think what's, what's interesting to me is the reverse side of that coin, which is this, that yes, we know that the EFF has radical policies that don't align with the DA's radical, um, uh, moderate policies or, or whatever. But in Joburg, where we actually saw this in practice, what I thought was that was quite interesting was that the DA was able to moderate some of the radical proposals of the EFF, and the EFF was able to get the DA to see that actually, you know, township development was important. And somewhere between those two extremes is actually a center of South African politics. Mm. That 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 really resonates with people. So, could we have a could we have a politics where, yes, the credibility of taking racial justice seriously is not in is not in question because the EFF is there, but the sound economic management and governance and and not going too far and not spoiling everything with 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 going too fast, is there some kind of, because that's what I think could topple the ANC. Yeah. Um, but right now I feel like with these three polls, neither of them is able to quite find that, that that sweet spot yeah without question i think that analysis is probably spot on so you know there is something to be said about counterbalancing forces yeah, yeah. in a coalition which does drive the debate somewhere towards a more rational yeah. middle ground yeah. uh, but at the same time local government is a lot easier to work in a non-ideological environment because sure. local government isn't about the economy it's not about uh, international relations it's not about these thorny issues it's about streets and electricity and roads and water. At yeah, least sure. it should be. Sure. Uh, and, you know, when you have, you know, parties of widely divergent views nationally, mm -hmm. everyone can agree to streets, roads, electricity and water. Yeah. And that's stuff that everyone gets behind. Sure, sure. And that's why Herman was able to produce budgets that were being voted for by the EFF and Freedom Front mm. three years in a row. Mm. Uh, because we're all for those things, right? Yeah. I think at a national level, it's a lot harder. But certainly, sure, I think there's, sure. there's, there's two things that need to be said for, for that kind of proposal. Mm. I think there is something to be said about a supply and demand relationship. So, you know, I yeah. don't think there yeah. could ever be a discussion around coalition partners yeah. and ideological partners and that kind of thing. But you might very well end up with a minority government at mm. a national level mm. that will have to shop around for votes in parliament mm. on different issues. And what's really healthy about that idea is the idea that it drives people to the middle because they have to work to get those yeah. extra votes and they've yeah. got to sit down and collaborate and listen. It also means parliament doesn't just rubber stamp everything. You actually have to work for parliament's approval. Absolutely. Yeah. But the part that I will get back to is that the EFF has to play a really big role in that yeah. regard, in my opinion, yeah. by you know changing some of the rhetoric, yeah, yeah, sure. which I think is really you know makes it problematic mm -hmm. to work with them. Uh, and certainly from that point of view, you know they would have to 
you know, come across in a far more reasonable way. I mean, their current approach towards these things is we will not talk to anyone unless they will nationalize the yeah. Reserve Bank and do this and do that. Yeah. And effectively, you know, that's why I say the EFF is very likely to be left on the dance floor with mm. no one to dance with. It's it's an interesting it's an interesting prospect, and there is that risk for them for for sure. Um, you know, this this year, I, I don't think South Africans have actually quite appreciated what 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 this year could mean because th there's there's a scenario in which the election is done and the cards have fallen where they've fallen and we go into parliament and nobody knows who the president is actually going to be until that vote happens how do you how do you you know have you thought about the amount of pressure the amount of eyeballs the amount of intrigue and interest that is going to be around all of you around the table come potentially come May or August or whenever it is? I suppose you, you don't really fully consider it until it happens. I mean, it'll be the first time for many of us to be in Parliament from an action yeah. say, standpoint. So I think there's a lot of things that's going to be, uh, you know, big moments that we're mm. going to have to live up to. I think one of the concerns we see in those moments in South Africa is the extent to which people's votes get bought under a secret ballot. Hmm. And the commoditization of votes in legislatures is a major, major problem. Hmm. You know, it happens at that. Of course. I mean, sure. there's been open allegations at a local government yeah. level. Yeah. We've had councillors of ours in Chwane who we've laid criminal charges, about two million rand bribes being offered hmm. to vote for the other side. And when you obviously consider mm. the corrupt interests that are involved in which government holds sway, yeah. I mean, there's probably no shortage of money available to fund those kind of programs. Mm. Mm. The problem is our law makes a secret ballot a right. Uh, and we've got to ask ourselves a question, do our lawmakers who are put there by the voters have a right to a secret ballot? Surely, you know, if there's a prevailing environment of fear and intimidation, fine. Sure. Per the judgment of the UDM versus Speaker. But, mm. you know, if there isn't, I mean, surely they've got to account for their votes and you can't if it's behind the cloak of secrecy. I think uh, beyond that, though, what we're going to focus on is obviously what we can control from the charter point of view. Yeah. And what I'm quite pleased to say is that our charter has agreed to do things quite differently when it comes to nominating premiers and presidential candidates, etc., the first is none will be nominated without a public lifestyle audit having been conducted. And we like that. We think that's a fundamental change sure. that we can offer so that if there's any person in our ranks who can't account for their lifestyle, they're not going to be a candidate. Mm. Uh, the second thing is we've changed the model, which we think is very flawed in coalition, saying you get this and I get that, like these are you know things that can be halved off and given to you. Yeah, I mean, It's not yours to have, the Ministry of Police or whatever. Mm. But what we actually want to change is have a merit-based conversation where we say, you know, the IFP yeah. says we've got a red-hot candidate for this portfolio. We think you should consider that. And if we're all in agreement, the merit-based consideration must mm. hold sway mm. uh, rather than just carving it up like, you know, yeah. allocating, you know, pieces of cake. Sure. It's got to be done differently. And, you know, on that, I was thinking about the, the multi-party charter and this – this thing we saw, which has gone quiet now again, it's South African politics, with uh, the emergence of Roger Jardine and change starts <laughs> now. I saw <laughs> you, you were very quick to comment on that. And who the president will be, let's assume the ANC is, is out of power and, you know, and somehow this charter gets over the line, whether you know, there's help from the EFF, but it's not part of it, or, or you, in fact, get 50.1%. To, uh, collectively the question of leadership does does come up yep. and one would have thought okay it's, it's basically either john stienhazen or herman mashaba because i suspect that you will be the two biggest parties out of those you know and there are there are problems with john which i've spoken about but he you know he could also be the leader and then there's herman mashaba and then suddenly we hear well no none of them there's going to be an, an, a potential new candidate which change starts now has also dismissed the, the, they say that's not not the plan but um what about the leadership of, of, of this and and you know i think that's a key question who would lead south africa into this new future so i think let me be clear firstly on the history of that story mm. i mean mm. it was astonishing we opened the sunday papers just like you did mm. i saw that story and we said what is going on here because you know, this wasn't on our radar. We weren't shopping around for another candidate, mm. et cetera. I mean, can you imagine as a group of parties, including our own, which is only three years old, we're campaigning about Herman, around Herman Mashab. I'm campaigning behind any other person. Mm. 
uh, and the idea of bringing in some kind of outside factor with no experience in politics, no track record beyond being a DG many, many, many moons ago uh, is just insane. Uh, there was something very funny going on in that party. I'm very glad it's not my party, so I don't have to deal with that kind of stuff. But, you know, from our point of view, the, the principle behind leadership is that the, the Charter has agreed. It's not necessarily from the biggest party. Uh, it has to be based on public sentiment. We can't say, because party A has got X percent and party Y has got less, therefore party A gets the presidential candidate, because South Africans aren't asked that question in the elections. And we need to go through a process like through polling, which can independently verify which of these leaders has the greatest appeal among South Africans, so that at least we give South Africans some kind of a voice that they're currently denied in their electoral system. I mean, you mentioned, I mentioned to you earlier about the lifestyle audits and how that's going to play a factor. And I suppose all of these things come together that it could be any number of people. Sure. I think from our point of view, the, the charter has been at pains to say there's no rush to go out there and say, you know, this is our president and this one we will nominate and this one we'll bring in, uh, principally because actually we should have confidence in the leadership in the charter. Uh, shopping around outside makes it look like you don't have confidence internally. Uh, and actually, the best thing parties in the charter can do is get big. The more votes that are won, the more chance it is of that 50% plus one scenario you were mentioning earlier. Yeah. And for Action SA to do that, we're going to campaign behind Herman Mashaba with everything we've got. So there are a number of, of other parties we've we've spoken about, the DA, the ANC, EFF. Uh, two that I want to bring to your attention. One is the Patriotic Alliance, which you've already mentioned. And, and I guess the question is, do they go in with your side of the, you know, electoral uh, uh, bargain or, I mean, I, in my view, the Patriotic Alliance could do quite frankly anything at any time. Or, or do, does the ANC say to them, hey, come along with us and maybe one other party and you can govern nationally. Um, what do you make of, of where they are? I don't think that they've declared at any point that they will be part of the charter. Um, no, in yeah. fact, it's kind of, you know, very regrettable that they've mm. attempted to join. Mm. Uh, and the approach was certainly from the DA, no ways, mm. which, you know, we found regrettable because, you know, right. there's, there's no there's no doubt that there are challenges with the PA. I'll come back to that in a moment sure. because certainly I'm not their spokesperson. Yeah, yeah. But there's a constituency. Yeah, there's no, clearly some growth. There's no doubt about that, yeah. Uh, and a large part about achieving change in South Africa going forward is trying to not push people into the other camp. And if you look at how the DA has taken the PA in Johannesburg, uh, and kicked them away on four occasions in opportunities to take back the city. There's no doubt that the DA prefers a PA that is in with the ANC so that they can de-campaign them around that issue in the Western Cape. Sure, that that sure. appears to be at the heart of the agenda. Uh, certainly, though, it, it must be clear that you know, the PA itself and its you know, approach to coalitions like auctions uh, creates difficulties for, for everyone. Mm. And, you know, the ANCs indicated that they find it very difficult to work with them. You know, obviously, there have been challenges in the coalition on our side with them. Yeah. And they, too, are going to find themselves potentially with nowhere to go. Uh, because, effectively, the deal with a coalition partner is that you need to be able to be relied upon. Yeah. Uh, and if there's going to be a dynamic where you join a coalition under these terms today, and tomorrow those terms are no longer acceptable and the goalposts move it's going to cause a massive challenge. Uh, and that's what makes the PA quite difficult in that regard or has up until now. Yeah, And I think that's been the experience on both sides of coalitions. But certainly, I mean, I think there's value to offer. I mean, in, in many regards, there is, you know, a constituency that's growing. Uh, and it doesn't make sense to chase political parties into the hands of the ANC, not from a, a coalition point of view, mm. even if it does from an individual party standpoint in terms of the Western Cape. But we think that should be deprioritized in favor of a national strategy. Bosa, um, Musi Maimane's Bosa and, and Rise and Zanzi are two new entrants in this election. Um, in some ways, maybe playing in a similar ballpark to where you're playing. Um, in some ways, probably different as well. But, I mean, firstly, there, there, there was always this, uh, there, there has been this hope that, that Musi and Musi Maimane and Herman Mashaba would be able to find each other. And I think that's what people thought might have happened in the early part of that. Um, 
your your thoughts on your thoughts on that, and then we'll get to Ryzen Zansi to to close off. Um, do you think that that's you know that's something that that could ignite uh, further interest? Is maybe a reamalgamation because because the the landscape is so so fragmented now. Yeah. Um, you know, wh- what are your thoughts on on Borsa and and maybe uh, Amai Mane, who also hasn't really declared? Um, you know coming in or, or re-amalgamating or, or something like that. Yeah, it's a strange situation. I mean, you're talking yeah. about the same ballpark. I'm not sure we're playing the same sport. <laughs> but, you know, there, there, there certainly are strong characters and strong individuals. I'm yeah. not sure how much of a, elect, uh, of a yeah. constituency there is per se yeah. uh, in either of those parties. But there are people there who should be coming together. And I think, you know, from, a, from an action essay standpoint, we think that there's scope for people to start coming together. I think people are concerned about the fragmentation of South African politics. Uh, and, you know, you can actually, you know, so often see that when one of these parties is posting, like, why don't you just join so-and-so? Like, what do, what do, yeah. why do you exist? Yeah. And I think from that point of view, you know, you've got to realize a national provincial election isn't like local government. Mm. In local government, you can have a speaker of Joburg with 1,500 votes, yeah. which is the most bizarre thing. But at a national level, I mean, you're not getting into parliament if you don't have 80,000 votes. And I think that's where numbers start to become reality. Mm. Uh, and uh, the ballot box is a brutal place. When mm. it measures a uh, political party, you can rationalize and theorize and explain it away. Yeah. But either you got the numbers or you don't. Yeah. But certainly, I think what is the tragedy that needs to be resolved is, is parties that share common values, that share principles, that share policies. Mm. Uh, and really, there should be better collaboration than there has been. Yeah. Well, I suppose you've answered the Rise of Zanzi question there as well. So, you know, just finally, um, what's the hardest part about starting a new political party? Because I know you've been back in in the weeds of it as well as in the forefront. But, you know, what does it take and, and what, what has been, you know, some of the hardest parts of that journey? Sure. Um, it's, it's hard to pick one. <laughs> but yeah. effectively, what you got to know is that the entire establishment is out to make sure that you fail. Mm. And I don't say that through some sense of drama and yeah. like, cue the music. Yeah. Uh, I say that from the point of view of just, you know, the establishment is set up to fund incumbency and create incumbency. Mm. So when the you know parliament sits down and debates funding of political parties, yeah. I don't know if you know this, by the way, is that as a taxpayer of South Africa, you are contributing towards 2 billion rand or 1.2 billion rands worth of funding of political parties. I mean, that's disconcerting for a lot of people who are saying, I didn't know that. And what it does is it takes a political status quo in parliament, which was last elected in 2019, mm. and it funds political parties in that vein. And what it means is even though Action SA is the sixth biggest party in South Africa, much bigger than you know the remaining nine parties that are smaller than than we are in parliament yeah those parties continue to get state resources mm. in generous amounts mm. uh and you know that is why you see massive rallies and all sorts of lavish expenditures mm. taking place and what it really does is it makes it hard to break through i mean the the truth is south african politics probably is one of the most expensive political systems mm. in the world because you don't have access to smartphones and data that mm. you have in the developed world. Mm. Uh, so a lot of it is about boots on the ground and, and, and direct voter contact, which is hugely expensive. Yeah, yeah. And building that infrastructure certainly has been challenging. But, you know, again, it's helpful that, you know, people see Action SA as a party that has emerged, has succeeded to a point at local government level. And I think you know, financiers of political parties are probably no different from voters in their views of saying, you know, there needs to be a change. It needs yeah. to be something new. And we've been quite fortunate to attract a lot of support there as well. Well, Michael Bowman, thank you so much for joining us on SMWX. All the best for 2024. And we look forward to welcoming, welcoming you back one of these days. Thank you. It's flown by so quickly. Indeed. Comment, like, share, subscribe. Let us know what your thoughts are on social media. And we'll see you for the next installment. Aye, yeah.